Uh, so if you've been with us for a while, we've been trying to walk our way through 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians is a letter that the Apostle Paul writes to this really young church in Corinth. It's not young that it had just started only, but it's young because it had just started with brand new believers and followers of Jesus. And so they had many questions. And maybe you feel like that sometimes as a follower of Jesus. I just have a lot of questions about this thing, and I'm trying to figure out what it means to be faithful to the Lord and what it means to honor Him in this current culture and in this life and in the relationships that, I ha- that you have with others. And if that's you, I want you to know that you're not alone in that. It's okay to have questions. It's okay uh, to try to figure out how does this thing apply and get lived out in my life. And, and so Paul is responding to many of the questions uh, that this church had. And over these next three chapters, chapters 12 and 13 and 14, Paul's going to talk about what does it look like to love and serve one another, to build up one another as members of God's church when you gather together. Now, we've talked about that a little bit uh, in the past, but this specifically uh, is about that question. And so we're going to talk this week and next week and in some of the other weeks, about spiritual gifts. And so maybe you've heard about spiritual gifts, maybe you haven't. Every 18 months, as a church leadership team, we've committed to doing a church health assessment called the PEAK Survey. And some of you have been here for that, um, and you've helped us fill out what, for some of you, feels like a tremendously uh, large amount of questions But one of the questions that always comes back on that, uh, relatively low, is that, you know, my church does not necessarily help me understand my spiritual gifts and how to use them. And so I'm going to start this whole series with, with a caveat, and that's this. There's a reason that that has been historically low over the times we've taken the peak survey, and that's because I am personally incredibly frustrated with how the modern church talks about spiritual gifts. And so instead of ranting, um, I've tried to avoid the conversation and help people get plugged into serving. But since we're here in 1 Corinthians, you get to hear all of my ranting. Uh, And so if you've never heard me rant, it's actually not that bad. So um, Paul starts out this section in chapter 12, and he says this to the Corinthian church. He says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. So, so Paul has received their questions, and it's been concerning enough to him that he thinks if they continue on in the current trajectory, then it's going to lead to a misuse and a misunderstanding of what these special abilities or spiritual gifts are. He says, you know that when you were still pagans, so before they were followers of Jesus and they worshiped many other gods and idols, you were led astray, swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so this may feel like a weird kind of way to start this idea of of spiritual gifts, but what Paul is saying is incredibly clear, and yet for some of us could be incredibly uncomfortable, and that's that there is both a seen and an unseen world. There is a seen and an unseen world world. There's things that we experience physically, we can see, we can hear, we can touch, we can taste, but also there is a spiritual world. And for some of you, the jump from a physical world that's tactile and tangible to a spiritual world is too big of a jump. But not only is there a spiritual world, I think we would all agree that in the unseen world, there's at least experiences and emotions that we have that we can't feel or touch. There's responses that we have in our minds and in our hearts. We call them our thoughts 
and we call them our emotions, that sometimes are connected to the physical world and sometimes feel absolutely disconnected from the physical world. You fall in love with someone for no reason, like not just because they're great looking or because they were nice to you, but, but there's something deeper, like there's this growing affection for that person that's, that's beyond the physical, it's happening in, in an unseen emotional realm where you feel connected, like, like they know you and understand you. And how do you measure that? Or how do you touch that? Or how do you write that down on a piece of paper? I think all of us would say, yes, there is a scene and an unseen world. And, and what Paul is saying here, that not only is there maybe what we would call the area of our soul in the unseen world, our emotions and our thoughts, but there's also a spiritual reality in the unseen world. That there are powers beyond our own personal powers. That there is, or our wills and intentions, beyond our own personal wills and intentions. That there are thoughts beyond our own personal thoughts. And maybe for some of you this is a struggle to navigate through, but for the Corinthian church it wasn't a struggle. They totally understood this from the gods that they worshiped before. That there was spiritual activity outside of the spiritual activity of God through Christ by the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so to recognize that in this unseen world, there's not just our own thoughts and emotions, but there's the thoughts and intentions of other spiritual beings is really important. And not only is there the Holy Spirit, and there's a reason that he's called the Holy Spirit, but there's also unholy spirits, what the Bible calls unclean or evil spirits. And yet there is one Holy Spirit who is stronger and more powerful, and above all of those other evil spirits with thoughts and intentions that are not for us, but are against us. Some of you, I say this to you, and you're like, man, I totally get it. I totally get it. I've had this encounter. I've had this experience. I had this dream. You recognize that, that those things, or even some of those thoughts, did not come from you, and they did not come from another human being. They randomly appeared in your mind. Those feelings or accusations appeared in your heart in a moment, and you knew that it wasn't sourced from within yourself. Some of you, and this is why we do freedom ministry and deliverance and things like that, uh, because we recognize what Paul is saying here and what the Corinthians understood as well. And that's that not only are there evil spirits, but there is a good and perfect Holy Spirit of God. And so when we embrace this reality, we can embrace the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And the Holy Spirit does good things. And he leads us in God's good plans. And he gives us good gifts. And, and so... This is what Paul is talking about, the gifts that proceed from this, from the powerful Holy Spirit of God. In verse 4, he says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. And so I think from this passage, we can understand that one of the concerns of the Corinthians is, hey, this person who says they're a follower of Jesus, when the Holy Spirit shows up in their life, it looks totally different in the way that they serve and help others than it does in my life. And so does that mean that they serve and worship a different God? And Paul is saying, no, 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 it's one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that gives all of these good gifts to. We're all under the kingship and lordship of the same God. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. And then verse 7 is one you should underline in your Bible. It's the main point of this passage, and that's that a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. 
To one person, the Spirit gives the ability. Um, to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The, the same Spirit gives great faith to another. Uh, and to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It's the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. And so, uh, Paul is, is helping us, and we'll talk about like the, specifics, the specific gifts next week and maybe what they look like, but as an introduction, um, I, I want to kind of enter into a bit of some thoughts here about spiritual gifts. One, Paul makes it very clear that it's the Holy Spirit that gives us spiritual gifts, and the intention of those gifts is to help and build up one another. That it's the Holy Spirit that gives each believer a gift. And so this is good news. It doesn't matter how mature, immature you are, how long you've been following Jesus. The moment that you put your trust in Jesus, God's Holy Spirit dwells in you. Now, you may not have felt anything different. You may not thought that the Holy Spirit has been dwelling in you, but the Holy Spirit resides in you. And He has given you a gift or maybe multiple gifts and, and maybe even different gifts over different times in your life, but those are meant to be received as a good gift and to be used to help and build up other people. Which leads us to this understanding that, that the goal of our relationships with one another should be to build up one another, to encourage one another, to speak words of life in one, to one another. And yet what happens so often, especially in the area of spiritual gifts, that's that you see someone else's gift that God has given them in his sovereignty through the Holy Spirit, and you think maybe about your gift, and you go, I wish I could be like them. I wish I could do that. I wish I could accomplish that. And maybe there's jealousy that happens. Or on the, on the person's part, we might say, man, like, I'm crushing it. I'm doing great with this. I'm really helping a lot of people. And Paul wants to emphasize in verse 7 that spiritual gifts without a servant heart often results in either jealousy or self-aggrandizement. And this is what was happening in the Corinthian church, is that you can pit your gift that God has given you, which is so ironic, against the gift that God has given someone else and determine which one has more value or lesser value. That is not God's intention. And so, let me talk a little bit. This is maybe a bit of the ranting part when it comes to spiritual gifts. Paul um, makes it very clear that it's the Holy Spirit of God that gives us uh, these spiritual gifts. And so, here's what I want you to know. If you're new to spiritual gifts, here's a couple of things to recognize. One, your spiritual gifts are not the same thing as your natural abilities. You have natural skills and talents, things that you're really good at, things that you can accomplish, but a spiritual gift is not sourced from yourself. It comes as a gift from the Lord. It's something that you can only do if God is the one gifting you to do it. And I feel like often in the Western church, um, we use this conversation about spiritual gifts in order to get people to serve in some way, right? Oh, you have the spiritual gift of teaching? You should really work with the kids. You have the spiritual gift of mercy? Oh, man, you'd be great with the kids. <laughs> you, you have the spiritual gift of worship? The kids really need 
And, and we kind of go, all right, what are, what are these like maybe natural inclinations or abilities? And let me try to plug you into a volunteer opportunity. Well, listen, your natural abilities are awesome. Like we need you to bring your strengths and your experiences, the things you know and understand, even if they're not from the Lord, and to use them in a way that honors the Lord. But just because you're good at something doesn't mean that it's a spiritual gift. Second, your personal preferences are not a spiritual gift. The way you view the world is not a spiritual gift. The way you think worship should go or not go is not your spiritual gift. Criticizing the pastor's sermon, not a spiritual gift. (laughs) Not that any of you would ever do that by any means. Right? And so often we can, we can say this is obviously sourced from within me because it's what I want. I haven't even asked God if he wants this at all. That's not necessarily a spiritual gift. And then three, I talked about it earlier. Your spiritual gifts are not a sneaky way for the church to get you to volunteer. And often we've said, hey, take this assessment and figure out the things that you think you're good at, and then we'll find a place for you to serve. And what I want to talk about today, and what I want to encourage you into today, if you've never been encouraged in this way, and that's for you to give up yourself, or as Paul says so often, to die to yourself, to be crucified with Christ, and say, even though I'm naturally good at this, God, is this a gift from you? Because spiritual gifts that Paul's talking about here are things that are fueled by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Again, I'm not saying that your natural abilities aren't good. We need them. We need to serve it together. But what Paul is talking about is something that is not, that does not come from within yourself. It comes clearly from the Spirit of God. And so, my encouragement for us today is to not be people that try to find our gift, but instead submit ourselves to the gift giver. And let him be the one who says, this is what I have for you. And so I've, as I've thought about this, what it looks like, as Paul says in verse 11, that it's the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. It's up to the Spirit of God to determine it, and He alone decides which gift each person should have. Recognize that you have a gift, and it's up to you to mine what that is in the relation, uh, within the relationship that you have with God through the Holy Spirit. And what this looks like apart from natural abilities, um, I'll share uh, from my experience. Here are the times that I find myself clearly in my mind and my heart. Like, I have things that I can do apart from God. I know that. There's things that I can accomplish apart from God. There's skills and abilities that I have. There's thoughts that I have that I can do apart from God. But what I've found God using in my life and equipping me with His gifts, uh, or when I've found that to be most likely, are in four different times. And so these are probably not the only times, but maybe you can take some of them and learn from them. The times I find myself most likely to manifest a spiritual gift, as Paul mentions here and then later on in verse 12. We'll talk about the specific ones next week, so come back um, as we talk about what those look like. But number one is worship, and specifically for me, that's going to be worship in music. It's not like a natural, it's not a thing I like totally uh, love and embrace, but it's in those moments when I I'm reminded of who God is, and I exalt Him for who He is, that it's less about me, and it's more about Him. And God has given me words of insight and discernment and prophetic pictures and all of those things in times of worship. And maybe you experience this as well, that, that when you're singing, whether you're by yourself in the car and you, you, know, you turn up your Spotify playlist or you're here as we gather together, that's why our times of worship together are so powerful. Not because the band's great, although they are great, but because it's in those times where we have a clearer picture of who God is in his greatness and who I am in my not great greatness. The psalmist says this in Psalm 22. It's one of my favorite verses. 
It says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. What is this saying? That, that when Israel, when God's people praise him, it's basically like rolling out the red carpet to his throne. Our praises are the pathway to get into his presence. And so there's, there's a clearer picture. There's, there's, a, there's an exalting of who he is. And of course, there's less concern about who we are. And so I find in worship that uh, there was moments. In fact, when we were candidating, that's almost seven years now, seven years ago now that we were candidating to come here, I remember I was sitting, we had pews, and there's red carpet and all of those things, and I was sitting there with Jen, and we were worshiping, and I felt the Lord say three very clear things to me. And some of those things were really hard to hear. Some of those things were about people in the church, things I never would have known. I had just showed up. I had said hi to people and like, where are the bathrooms, right? But God said some clear things about specific people. And those things um, all came to, to the light that they were true. And so God was extending a gift of discernment and understanding uh, to me to, to, to have a bit of a heads up of what we're entering into. And God was gracious. And it was in times of worship that those things happened. Second, times I find myself most likely to manifest a spiritual gift. That's in times of prayer. And specifically for me, it's times when I am praying for other people. It used to be times when I'm praying for other people when I'm with that person. But even now, it's times when I'm praying for people uh, even when I'm with those, when I'm not with those people. And so uh, when I pray, I don't just try to say what I think God wants to hear, because that's dumb. Um, but I really try to listen to the Lord. Lord, what, what do you want for this person? What do you want me to say right now or not say right now? Like, I've got a lot of good ideas of what you should do in this person's life. Uh, but I submit and I surrender my will to yours. And isn't that what Jesus taught us when he taught us to pray? To pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we pray like that, instead of, Lord, my will be done, my name be glorified, my name be lifted up. When, when we pray as Jesus did in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. When we pray those things, God downloads to us the things that we need to know and understand. There's times that I'm praying for people and praying uh, healing for people, and God will say, uh, this is how long it's going to take for me to heal them. And then I have to discern, Lord, do I need to say that out loud? There's times that I've been praying and God will say, I'm not going to heal them physically right now. And so he instructs me in how to pray in compassion and understanding. I was driving down the road uh, just this week and I was praying uh, for someone in our church and um, really I was, uh, there wasn't like something desperate that I was trying to get God to accomplish. God just brought this person to mind so I started praying for him and he gave me a really clear picture and vision uh, for them in my mind as, as I was driving. And so just praying that reality into, into those people's, into that person's life. Maybe you experience this as well. It's in, in times when we pray, again, not our will, but God's will be done. When it's less about us and it's more about God, then he's able to empower us with gifts that are helpful to others. Uh, the third time, this is less um, for me, but maybe it might be for some of you, times I find myself most likely to manifest a spiritual gift, and that's in times of service, especially behind the scenes service, not up front service. Now, even when I'm up here and I'm speaking or helping lead worship or something like that, I always try to ask the Lord, what do you want me to say? Especially in preaching. In my early days of preaching, I said so many stupid things. And now in these days, you were like, you still say so many stupid things. <laughs> You'd be surprised of what I don't say. 
Uh, and that's because there's times where the Lord will say, hey, uh, you just don't need to go there. You may have thought that was going to be clever or a fun zinger or whatever the case may be, uh, but you don't need to go there. And so even uh, in times of serving up front, um, submitting myself to the Lord and trusting that He's going to lead and guide through His Spirit, He's going to give me direction, leadership, and understanding. But the temptation in the front to forget yourself or to remember yourself, I should say, is far greater than when you serve behind the scenes. And so serving behind the scenes is a way better practice uh, in order to really encounter God and have Him uh, fill you and minister to you. And so our serving of one another is the purpose of our gifts. And to choose serving, even if you don't know how you're gifted or if you have the ability to do it, to enter in with a servant heart uh, is so vital because God can show up in those moments. John says this uh, in his letter, uh, 1 John. He says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, this is in the context of meeting each other's needs um, and caring for one another. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us oh, well, no wonder when, it, when I'm not trying to get what I want or accomplish what I want, but I'm willing to serve others, to give of my time and my energy and resources, that I find myself encountering God in real and powerful ways and Him equipping me uh, to do things that are beyond my ability. So it's in these moments of service when we choose to do things even though we would say, man, that doesn't feel like it's right or it doesn't fit for me. Like some of you, honestly, I joked about the kids thing, some of you just need to serve in the nursery. And that's not because we need people to serve in the nursery. Some of you just need to serve behind the scenes. Some of you just need to serve, period. And, and, and in that, God will unlock something of your relationship with Him and encounter with Him. Maybe you feel like, I just haven't been able to hear from Him, and that's because you haven't been serving, and your eyes have been on yourself instead of on others. So serve. Serve. Whether you know how to serve or what to serve, just serve. And you don't have to serve in a traditional ministry team and volunteer at the church. If something else God has put on your heart, then let's move forward with that. If you need somebody to walk with you, let us encourage you and walk with you in those things. But service is the way, is one of the ways that we become less self-centered. And then finally, and this is probably the hardest one, uh, and that's actually addressing your weaknesses. So often, especially uh, even in Christian leadership and ministry leadership, uh, we're talked about, you talk about your strengths and your gifts. Man, work in your strengths and your gifts. Do what you're good at. Do what you can be effective and accomplish. And yet, all that makes is somebody who is really good at having bad character. It's when we face our weaknesses that we grow in our character and, and uh, Paul talks about in Romans, it's when we go through trials that we learn perseverance, and it's in perseverance that our character is formed, and it's when our character is formed that we know that God has not left us alone, and there's hope for transformation, and there's hope for something different. And so, I challenge you, don't just make excuses for your weaknesses, face them. Face them with the Lord. If you respond poorly in a situation, in a relationship, don't just make an excuse for your bad response. Ask the Lord, Lord, why did I respond in this way? This response was not what Paul says in another letter, the fruit of the Spirit. It didn't look like love or joy or peace or patience. It didn't look like kindness or faithfulness, or gentleness, or self-control. It didn't look like any of those things. So obviously, I wasn't responding through the Holy Spirit. I was responding in my own self and my own desires. And so, Lord, what is it? What is it that causes me to respond in that way? It's when we're willing to face and walk with the Lord by the Holy Spirit through 
the weak areas, the character defects, the personality um, defects that we find that God proves himself to be greater than we could ever understand. Paul says this in another letter to the Corinthian church. He says, talking to God about what he would call the thorn in his flesh and this thing that never went away and was always bugging him and bothering him. Paul says, each time God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. If his power works best in weakness, then that seems like a great way to go because his power is better than your power. His power is greater than my power. So let's choose the path of weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is kind of the big idea of spiritual gifts. It's not something that comes from you. It's something that comes from God through the Holy Spirit. And when we have a better understanding of who he is, like when we walk with him through some of the hardest parts of our character, uh, the, the ugliest parts of our personality, then his power, the power of Christ, can work through me. And so listen, you've got talents and you've got abilities. You've got skills. I strongly encourage them, or encourage you, to use them with a servant heart. But there is a power from God that manifests itself in spiritual gifts that is even beyond that. And so, some of you just need to spend some time this week in worship or in prayer, or in whatever thing allows you to just kind of forget yourself in this whole thing and allows you to focus on the Lord and what He desires to do. Because wouldn't it be awesome? And some of you have already experienced this. But wouldn't it be awesome if we were a church full of people filled with God's power? Given the gifts that God determines we need in the season that we're in. That sounds great to me, and I think it'll be for the benefit of each other and for the world. Hey, I was thinking about this um, earlier and didn't put it in my notes, but for some of you, like, this doesn't apply because you haven't made the choice to follow Jesus yet. And so if, if you've never chosen to put your trust in Jesus, uh, Paul says later in this letter, what the gospel is, and that's that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again three days later, and then he was seen by many people. It's not just a historical fact what Jesus has done, but it's a personal reality when you choose to receive it by faith. That the sins and guilt and shame that you carry around with you is not what God intends for you. And when you come and put your trust in Jesus and his work on the cross, he promises to forgive and cleanse you of that sin and shame and guilt. And the, the way that you experience that, the Bible says, is through faith. It's through trust. It's through believing that it not just happened, but that it happened for you. Not just that he did it, but that he did it for you. And so if you want to receive uh, Christ and follow him today, as an act of faith. I'd love to talk with you afterwards, but I want to pray for you now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, uh, for your word. Thank you for these reminders that there's things beyond ourself. There's, there's, there's a power beyond ourselves. There's understanding and knowledge beyond our understanding and knowledge. That there's abilities beyond our own abilities that allow us to serve one another really well. It happens when we surrender ourselves to you, when we fix our eyes on you, when we look to you. And so, Lord, I pray that we be a people that do that. And, Lord, 
we sit with you with open hands and we ask that you would give us the gifts that you determined for us. The gifts that you decide through your Holy Spirit. The abilities that are beyond our ability and power and strength. the insight and understanding that's beyond our knowledge and our experience. We come to you and say, whatever you have to give us, we'll receive it joyfully and we'll use it for your glory in order to serve and help others. For those of you today that are like, man, I need something that's beyond myself because what I've been doing is not working. I'm still stuck in those self-centered thoughts, those selfish behaviors. That today you can come and you can put your trust in Jesus and you can say to him, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus, what you did on the cross for my sins, dying in my place, for my forgiveness, and to be cleansed from guilt and shame, I trust that it's true and I give you my sin. Lord, the new thing that you desire to do in me, Lord, I trust in you for it. I trust in you to lead me into the new way of living and thinking and to follow Jesus. Lord, in the same way that you came not to be served, uh, but to serve and give your life as a ransom for many, may that be our heart as well in all of this, to serve for your glory, for the benefit of one another. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.